Amen. Good evening, Pastor. Good evening, uh, good evening, family. Uh, we're going to do a quick review of last week's lesson, um, an imperfect analogy, part two. And the question that we are going over is question number seven. What are the decrees of God? And the answer is, the decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory, he hath forth ordained whatsoever comes to pass. And in this picture, we have our, our, mate, our mate Shorty. And in this picture, we, we see that he is finishing the plan for his house. Um, even before the foundation of his house was, is even laid, he has worked out just how the house is going to go. Everything that will be done according to this blueprint. Um, and this is the same analogy that we use to understand the plan of God. Um, although it is, it is an imperfect analogy, we, we use this to try and understand how God put things into place. Um, for just as Shorty plans everything that goes into his house, God plans everything that happens in this world. So another difference between the plan of God and the plans that people make is the fact that God's plan is absolute. God is absolute, and so God knows everything, and nothing happens without God knowing that it will happen, or that it will happen a certain way. When a human makes a plan for a house, he has, by that plan, a measure of control over what happens. But this plan does not determine everything. It does not cover every single detail, such as the exact number of nails to be used in the building of the house. Um, neither does it determine before just how many days it will take to build that house. So we have a blueprint. We don't know exactly everything that we will require to build that house. But God's plan, like I said, is absolute. So God knows everything. Everything is planned before in the mind of God. God's plan does determine absolute everything. It even includes two kinds of events or happenings in the world that people often think of as outside of God's control. And that first one is that things happen by chance or by accident. And we had the illustration and the scriptures of the dice being thrown. So that's the first one, chance or accidental. And the scripture we have here is Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. In proper context, God is not saying that the dice will result in his will being known or done. What God is saying is that in spite of using the dice, the outcome will still be the same for what he has said. God would not encourage use of objects or superstitious avenues. All things are determined by God. That is, God knows how all things will turn out. All things will work according to God's decree. And so far, God's plan is concerned. There are not accidents, no event that comes as a surprise to God or upset his plans. In spite of us, God's plan works out. And the second one is man's free will. What about man's free will? If God knows everything, how can we say that we have free will? The choices that men make are known by God because God knows mankind intimately. That is, God knows what a person will do. God does not make a person do evil. Yet God knows that because of the nature of that individual, the choice, the free will choice they make will be an evil one because God knows our character. And Acts 2.23 says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. This is referring to Judas. God did not make Judas choose evil. No, God knew that Judas had the nature, the characteristics, and the traits that would lead to this decision. God knew this in the foundation of the world. It is vital to understand that God cannot plan sin. God cannot put in the heart of any person to do evil. 
There is no evil or darkness in God. God knows you will sin, but God does not make you sin. This is your choice. God is completely holy, separate from sin, and his eyes too pure to look on iniquity. Habakkuk 1.13. And God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 and 5. God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33, which means that he cannot in any way be the author of evil. So in conclusion from the review, we have question seven. What are the decrees of God? And the answer is the decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory, he hath forth ordained whatsoever shall come to pass. Back to you, Pastor. Amen. Let's put our hands together for our Reverend Danielle in her review. Thank you, Reverend. Amen. And we are now going to take off from there and head to lesson three lesson three uh, before we hit the review uh, quiz. Oh, I shouldn't keep saying quiz, innit? I should just teach the lesson. All right, here we go. So, <laughs> all right, folks, here we go. The overarching, of course, main thought we're dealing with is the counsel of God. <laughs> I mean, just reading that is a statement. Truth is, there is no counsel of God. It's just God alone. Nevertheless, let's read the question as it stands. Question seven, what are the decrees of God? And the answer is the decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory, he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. And so tonight we're dealing with part three. Uh, dealing with analogies. So this is another imperfect analogy that helps us to understand the counsel of God, the vastness of God. And in particular, we're looking at the phrase tonight, for his own glory, for his own glory. So tonight our focus is on the part of the answer, which says for his own glory. Here's my big response before I teach in more detail. God does not need glory because God is perfect. All that he created will ultimately honor and glorify him. It came from him and must reflect back to him. <laughs> that's why we say glory to God. Amen. When we uh, do something that's like really wonderful and we know it impacts the kingdom. Oh, immediately we know, whoa, that's not, that's not about me. I'm not building a little cult here. I'm not an idol because God said, I'm not going to have, you will not have any idols or gods before me. So we quickly say, what this bit of glory feels good. Wow. On human flesh to God be the glory. All right. If not, we watch it. Now I'm teaching before I'm not speaking to you. Okay. We get puffed up, lifted up in pride. And you know what happens then, right? So there must be a constant humbling of ourselves. God. God, you get the glory. You made everything for your glory. You are glorified. Keep that in mind as we go through the teaching. For what reason did God make this perfect and all-inclusive plan? The catechism says that it was for his own glory. This does not mean that by doing this, God made himself more glorious than he was before. Remember, there is no before or after in God. It simply means that God does not explain what he does by giving us a reason that goes beyond himself. God is God alone, that's why we say it. Who are we to try to define God? That's where we get in trouble. When we try to bring a human understanding to something that's beyond us, that's why we walk by faith. What we do know and we do feel, woo, that's glory. By the way, Shekinah, glory, uh-huh. Yet we cannot comprehend the fullness of who he is. We accept that God is all glorious, all on his own. Now understand, picture it now, <laughs> Sicily 19, all right, that because God is alpha, 
and Omega. God is already who he is at the beginning and at the end. God does not need to be made more of who he is. God is complete. Let, let me expand on that a little bit more to make sure you got it. God is Alpha and Omega. He is. He's not becoming. He already is. So it's not like he's on a journey and is picking up stuff to make him who he is at the end. He's already that. God is the fullness of God. There is nothing he stands in need of. Oh, wow. That's glory. Okay. We say it sometimes like this. God is God all by himself. We are saying that God's glory is all glory and cannot be added to. That's why, let me say this to encourage you, church. We've got to lean in on God. I, I don't know about you. Uh, I certainly know about me. At times, I, I'm concerned about family members, this and that. And if I try to figure it out, I'm going to get messed up. So that's when I got to lean in. What? Trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding, but in all my ways, acknowledge him for he shall direct my path. He who is glorious and knows the end of the matter will help me through each matter. Amen. All right. We are saying that God's glory is all glory and cannot be added to. God's glory speaks to who he is. If you or I did things because of or for our own glory, this would be wrong because humanity demonstrates that we are not glorious. <laughs> we are faulty. We get tired. We are still learning. We are not inclusively complete. That is, we are not complete within ourselves. <laughs> I mean, think about it, simple thought, simple thought. <laughs> when I was 25, I didn't know I had that at age 57, I would, I would look this way and be the way I am. You see, see, <laughs> I'm just trying to help you with simple matters, you know, simple matters. Um, when I was eight years old and I got glasses, or well, before I got glasses, and I thought that's the way the world was. I didn't know that one day that I was going to see that the grass was actually made up of individual blades of grass. I'm just trying to say we don't know everything. And so I'm not complete within myself. And I have to know that even as your pastor, I can never believe that a church and being the pastor of a church means that I've got all the answers and, and, and I'm the go-to person. No, 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 no. Some things I need to take my time, think about, go to God, extra time, even fast about, you know, because the answers are not in me inclusively. We are not complete with ourselves. The contrary is true, church. God is all glorious. And therefore God commands Glory, because he is glory. Right. Now, God cannot deny himself. Since he is supreme, he must, to be true to himself, do his good pleasure always and seek his own glory above all. In other words, and it's easy with, um, it's easy outside of humans. Let, let me take you to Genesis. God said to the fish, fish, I command you to swim. So within the fish is a glory of swimming. I'm being very simple here. Now the fish today are still swimming. Somebody's going to get it in a minute. This is, okay, let me help you out. This is the same God that said, your man. <laughs> And you're a woman. But today, we're saying something else, right? So I'm saying that there's things that are created for his glory. And right now, you have to think and we have to think daily. 
Am I bringing glory to God? Am I reflecting God's word, which is a ream, a reflection of who he is? We have to be found in the word of God. If not, we're not giving God glory. Hmm. Think about that. And then Psalms 86 and verse 10, it reads here again at the reading of God's holy word, for you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. No comparison. Ain't nobody else got this, this glory. This is, this is all glory. I may have a glory moment. You know, if I was an athlete and I wanted to go out medal, I'm going to have a glory moment. As a matter of fact, church, according to the book of Revelation, every bit of glory that we end up receiving by getting those rewards and our those stars and our crown, you know what we're going to do? We're going to say, hey, Jesus, you, you get the glory. Because even that which you permitted me to do is not of me. Hey, it's of you. And so I render to you that which belongs to you. And thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to borrow just a bit of who you are on earth. You trusted me with it, God, and I'm carrying it out. Oh, my gosh. This is the responsibility that when we are in the kingdom, that all we do, God, get the glory. Wow. Hallelujah. First Timothy 1 and 17, it reads, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalms 148 and 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. That's right. It's out of this world, you all. It's out of this world. Because <laughs> I'm talking about the lower heavens right there. Eee, if you can see it, my God, I, I hope somebody's celebrating. If you can see it, if you can make it, because God gives you the ability, his glory is way above that. It's immortal and invisible. You see, we're mortal and visible. Somebody's going to get it. Hey, I keep saying that because I'm just enjoying. I love the scriptures. Amen. I do. Hallelujah. We believe that God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. While this is true, we cannot conclude that God, watch this now, is the author of sin. Oh, we can talk about this. God is not. We cannot conclude that God is the author of sin. One, it is not true that God is the author of sin. God cannot plan sin because there is no sin in God. God will not accept or look upon sin. Sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. Oh, this is going to get really wonderful. Oh, boy. Okay. Did God create sin? Sin exists. God made everything. So did God make or create or author sin? Okay. Those are the questions I asked. I was being the student. Okay. Let's carry on. Well, the fact of the matter is it's an incorrect question. It's an incorrect question. Oh, boy. Don't miss this. Have your thinking caps on, your ears attuned as I read this. Watch this. I'm going to read it carefully. The reason we're confused is because the question itself, it's incorrect. It's wrong. Listen to me. Sin is not a created thing like stars or animals. Rather, sin is a wicked perversion of good things that God has made. I want you to think about something now, church, that when we read the account and we're dealing with Pharaoh, right? In him being told to let the children of Israel go. When God steps out, People are left to their own demise. When the goodness of God draws back, you're going to do wicked. 
And so wickedness and evil is the absence of good. So if you're not doing good, you make way for bad. God didn't create the bad. God create, God is good, created good, all of that. But when you reject him, you're left without God, which means you're left without good. Okay, then let's read some more. Let's read some more. For example, listen, the sin of adultery is a twisting of the good created gift of marriage. Ah, God created marriage. But when you chalk God out and do things God said not to do, you get that other yucky stuff. I'm going to just call it yucky stuff, right? Let's get to another one. The sin of pride is a corruption of a healthy self-esteem. It's okay to know that you do something well. However, when you take the credit to yourself, when you think it's about you only, you're now stepping into pride. Instead of lifting up God, when God allows you, allows me to be successful, ooh, thank you, God. Instead, you say, yeah, that's me. Nobody can do it. And get that. God ain't nowhere in the picture. Pride. Okay, I think you're getting it. Let's do another one. And the sin of revenge seems tantalizingly close to the righteous zeal for justice. Ah, see, now that's where people like activists, social activists, right? We won't write, we won't write. Yeah, but we can't go killing people because they do wrong. You see? <laughs> we can't hate people because they do wrong. No, then you're taking righteous zeal into a revenge attitude. And God ain't getting that picture, right? You have to leave that to God. I carry on. Sin is parasitic. Ooh. On the good desires that God created us to enjoy and fulfill. Mm. It's like, you know what? It's like you got a nice summer day and sin is like that dark cloud of rain that just hanging around that wants to rain on your picnic. Uh, that's the image I got. I just shared it with you. Rain on your picnic. Hmm. This is why <laughs> our hearts can be seduced into sinning against God. Ephesians 4.22 and James 1.14. Sin is tempting. It's tempting. You know, I had a, my nephew on this weekend hit the, um, scored the winning penalty shot for Dandy Town. What? You would have thought I attended the game. I was so excited and happy when I found out. You would have thought I knew about football. You would have thought I knew any other player. You would have thought I, like, I don't know nothing about football, except I wanted to get in the net. But, oh, oh, he came up the house, I was with mom, and my brother Raymond took a picture of Raymond the third with my mom. And I was like, yes, yeah, I was all excited. Now, after that excitement, let me tell you what I did. I spoke to Raymond the third about the fact that God gave him that talent and that he has to balance all that football and stuff he's doing with coming to church. And even my brother agreed, hi, Raymond, right? Because if not, this is what we do in Bermuda. We lift, listen, see, amen. Is it true? Yes, thank you, Holy Ghost. We have made heroes out of football players. Say it more, okay. Our children know more football heroes than Jesus. Come on, somebody. They are more committed to the football, the football field, the practice, than to God. I'm going to tell you, Lord have mercy. I didn't see it until I'm talking about it. That's why I'm taken aback by it. We have made them to make football and football players idols. 
it only convinces me more of my next move. I talked about it last night. We've made it an idol. And God, oh, God says, you want idols? I'm going to show you what I do. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Let me carry on. Let me carry on. Hallelujah, God. So I say this sentence, yet yeah, because sin is not the way that God designed creation to work. Sin in the end will never satisfy us, but only will only corrupt us and leave us ever craving for more. That's all it, you know, we sing the song, I'm satisfied with Jesus. My soul is satisfied, said he'll be my comfort, said he'll be my guide. Looked at my hands, they look new, looked at my feet and they did too. Ever since that wonderful day, my soul is satisfied. See, our satisfaction is in Jesus. Hey, it's in our relationship with God. In that way, our satisfaction doesn't become corrupted. Now, listen, I've been married 37 years, coming up in a couple of months. If my full satisfaction, you know what I'm saying, was in my husband, I'd be in trouble. And if his was in me, uh, he would be in trouble. God must come first. Okay? All right, all right. Let's carry on, church. Let's carry on. The subtopic right here, this is a warning against wrong conclusions, right? Because some people think that Mankind are pawns on the chessboard. No, number two, mankind are not pawns on God's chessboard. It is true indeed that God has already determined the destiny of every man. Some will be saved as God has appointed, and some will be lost as God decreed. Now get, there's a difference. All right, he hasn't appointed people to be lost, but he knows some will. It's just like we, we as parents, we do not appoint our children to fail. But we know if they're disobedient and hard at it, they're going to fail in some things. Right? So that's the difference. Some will be saved, God appointed. Some will be lost as God decreed. Choices, folks. All right, let's go to the next slide there. The Council of God, again, I'm looking at it. And this is talking about what I just said. You got an appointment. And the question is, will you make your appointment? Because God doesn't want anyone to miss the appointment, but he knows people are going to miss the appointment. Some people on the dying bed are not going to confess Jesus Christ. Some people are going to attend funerals of folks and want to see them and see the nana and papa and uncle and big mama and big daddy and everybody, but they will not make the appointment. They will not make the appointment. Chairs are there. I, I want you to look at this. Chairs are right there. And people are saying, cancel the appointment. Cancel it. What? That's what I do. What the doctor's saying. Well, what can you do? You have the door open. Jesus is the door. You wait. But you got to make the appointment. We know we need it at funerals. But after the wait, it seems like it's over. Let's go to the next one. I'm just sharing some pictures. Again, appointment, appointment. Jesus is tenderly calling and waiting. His word is being preached. That's why we've got to shine forth, church. We are that person sitting. And we don't know who will finally hear the gospel message. And so we don't, we don't get to say, I think, I think in, on, on the chessboard, I can see there are porn that, that gets kicked off the chessboard. You know, we don't get to make that conclusion. We have to preach and minister and encourage everybody. You can't say, oh, that person's an atheist. Oh, that person hates Christians. That's not our job. We don't get to make that judgment. We don't get to make that judgment call at all because we cannot condemn us so. So we have to keep on teaching, keep on. It doesn't get tiring sometimes. Mm -hmm. Frustration, mm -hmm. just weary something. Mm -hmm. And then you got to ask God to strengthen you. Okay, some of you, you know, I'm, I'm the pastor chef. You all know that, right? You all do know that, right? Right. 
Why do you think sometimes I've got work to do, but sometimes I, I got to switch gears. I got to do something that's different, relaxing. If not, I can get bogged down with the image of, are they getting it? Who's making it in? And it, it can really take you somewhere. And, and, and in my humanity, I've got to recognize you're not God, you're not all glory. And so listen, take a break and do what you need to do to reconstitute yourself so you can stand and study and minister to God's people. One more image here. Here we go. This is the big question. Where are you? <laughs> of course, those of you who are in the Zoom room, I'm pretty sure you've already sat at the seat of decision and made your calling and election sure. Everyone else, we keep on teaching. We keep on preaching. We keep on asking. Most of all, we keep on being a witness. You be the shining light. You know, I, I do, hey, let me just say it. I do commercials and things and I want people to share them. You think I wanted to share them because I need to be bigged up because I can do a commercial? I know I can do a commercial. No, this is about who knows who will read uh, or view the commercial and say, hey, I need to make my appointment. Come on now. We always got to keep this in mind. All right, let's carry on. Uh-huh. Okay. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, it reads, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Important, folks. Remember, we're talking about the appointment. And God says, I, I, I have not made the appointment that anybody should perish, that anybody should experience my wrath. But in order to avoid the wrath of God, you got to obtain the salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the bridge, the dead man, the intercessor that God sent to bridge the gap and cause us to make our way back to him. Ain't no other way, no other way. Ah, beautiful right here. Look at it, people. Look at it here. Oh, glory. Second Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing to, mm, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Important. It is not God's will, but he can't force you. He is, it, the Bible says it right there. He's not willing that any should perish. So God, what do you want? All to come to repentance. Why? Because my son died for the world. That's all. Okay, important there. And so we're, again, let me just say, uh, we are not pawns. We get to make choices. Mankind, they are lost because of their own. And I thought that was interesting, earn, earn. Oprah Winfrey now, anyway. All right, because of their own choices. Uh-huh, that's the one that says it's a lot of other choices. Isn't the irony quite something? I love it. They are lost because of their own choices. For the decree of God does not in any way weaken or destroy the responsibility of people. I ain't sending anybody to hell. That's you. You make your choice. You open the gate to hell or the door to heaven. The gate or the door. <laughs> your choice. And you can't say, oh, that's church people. Oh, they were awful and horrible and all the hypocrites and and this happened with my great aunt and my mama told me stories. Yeah, yeah, you better make your own choice. There is a church for you. It may not be Shekinah Worship Center. There is a church for you because God is going to make sure because he is not willing that you shall perish. And so there is a church for you so that you can step through the door. Hallelujah. And make your way. Make your way to the kingdom through Jesus Christ. 
our Lord and Savior. Amen, church. That's, that's it. That's the lesson. And I hope you got it. I hope it was clear. Amen. I think it was clear, folks. I believe this teaching is providing extra strength to our knowledge of understanding that God is all God and yet gives us all choice to choose him. Because you know what? He's God by himself. <laughs> you get that. He ain't like, oh, Maria's so special. I need, I need, I need. No, no, no. He's like, you better choose me. If not, next. All right, all right. Amen. Superintendent, thank you for sharing that. Amen. And uh, folks, I hope you have been blessed by the teaching tonight. Did you learn something? Was something made clearer? That's always important. We can never have wasted time on the screen, right? In church. Amen. Amen. And be bold about your gospel. And listen, when other folks are not accepting of our Jesus, you need to celebrate. You kept your appointment. Hallelujah. Because there's another appointed appointment. It is appointed that men will die. And after they die, comes the judgment. So you better keep your appointment while you live. Because you will keep the point, appointment after death. <laughs> Let me say that again. I would advise, if you don't know Jesus, I'm not talking to you, I'm looking now at her because I know you all do. If you don't know Jesus to the pardoning of your sins, make your appointment immediately, this instant, and choose Jesus. Because when time turns into eternity, through death or through the rapture, that appointment time is closed, reservations canceled, and now you're going to have to make an account, give an account for your lack of choosing God, Jesus, and the kingdom of heaven. Hey, everybody dies going to heaven. Got some teaching coming up on that. 